Hello, and welcome back to Raised by Giants, where we talk all things spirituality. I'm Ryder Lee. Tonight, we have returning guest, the ET Whisperer, Rob Gerthier. But before I introduce him, check out Raised by Giants on Rockfin. It is a completely uncensored platform. Go over there, set up a free account, get all of my regular content I post on here and all the other creators' content as well, and sign up for Rockfin's premium content, which is far less than a YouTube premium account. And you'll get all of my premium uncensored content when it gets released and all of the other creators, premium uncensored content as well. Check the link in the description to sign up for the video streaming platform, Rockfin. Also check out C60 Purple Power. It is the most powerful antioxidant on the planet. It helps with energy levels, skin problems, infections, eyesight, brain cognition, EMF radiation, and a lot more. Is it a It is a free radical sponge that gives your body the ability to heal itself. And if you use promo code GIANTS10 from the link in the description, you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. Highly recommend it. I've been using it for over a year now with my own money, and I would not recommend something that doesn't work. So without further ado, introducing tonight's returning guest, Rob Gerthier. He is world-renowned professional ET channeler since 2010. He is the official channeler of Eridif, T-Reb, and Nyel Collective, and also channels Metatron. He has been featured on Gaia TV, Tuning In documentary, as well as featured in many books, podcasts, radio shows, and internet TV shows. The guides Rob channels are expressing true self empowerment. Hello, Rob. Thanks so much for coming back on the show, brother. Really appreciate you. How are you doing, my friend? Doing great, brother. I'm happy to be here with you tonight. Uh, Always a great unexpected surprise to pop in and be able to do something like this with you. And I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I've got a chance to connect with you a lot more lately. It's been nice. Yes. uh, Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. And I really enjoyed our last conversation. I thought I would reach out to you. I know it was kind of last minute, but uh, yeah, I believe that you're a real authentic, genuine channeler, right? Which is uh, very rare within the community these days. And for the viewers that might not have seen our previous interview or aren't familiar with your work, could you give maybe a brief background on yourself and how you started channeling yeah um back in about 2008 uh 2006 actually probably around 2006 or 7 uh it's when i had started coming out of a drug addiction i'd been addicted to drugs for a long time uh, nearly a decade um my son was born with uh, some severe medical problems cerebral palsy which was brain damage at birth Um, And that sent me to a pretty wild depression and that depression led to drug use and drug use led to a lot of worse drug use and became more than just getting pain meds from the doctors and turned into a whole really long, intensive uh, drug addiction. After that, I stopped using drugs and I started feeling different in a whole lot of different ways. I revisited some excitements from my childhood Uh, such as looking at UFOs, looking at what happens to people after they die. Uh, I grew up in a a church setting, uh, but it never felt right. I I, I never uh, kept going to church when I was a teenager and kind of dropped out. Um, But I always figured that there was something more. So I start exploring and doing meditations uh, until I bumped into to a spiritualism church and they taught me a lot of stuff and I ended up leaving there for the same reason the organized feel to the religion and some of the dogma wasn't good Um, so I leave there and I end up going into the Hemisync program I found it online um, by Anirio Beats and I used that for a while Uh, it took my meditation to a new level and then after meditating one night when I was feeling particularly off Uh, having a very difficult time uh, with my son's mom, which was my wife back then. Um, And with that meditation, I met Treb, and and Treb is an extra-dimensional being. Uh, He's not physical on our level, but he would be physical in the higher dimension. And I met him in a meditation, (laughs) so as you can imagine, uh, I thought my brain might have been broken. Um, but I kept going back to revisit, you know, I kind of replaced my drug addiction with meditation addiction. Um, and after I met Trev, I didn't meditate for like three or four days, which was unheard of, especially when I was dedicating hours and hours and hours a day. 
Um, so I went back and I talked to him and I talked to him again and again and again. And finally, I started looking at some of the things he was saying when I figured out that my brain wasn't broken and I wasn't having a mental breakdown or, or something wasn't wrong with me. Um, I started looking at some of the things he said and I found other work and I said, wow, you know, this is saying the same thing that Treb's saying just in different ways uh, with different terminology. So I kept working with Trep, just in meditation, uh, no channeling, just go into a meditation, connect with him, talk to him face to face, seeing him, he's seeing me, uh, just like we're doing, but not over the internet, you know, face to face. And then after about, I would say close to two years of, of being connected with him, uh, I said, you know, the information you're sharing has shifted my life completely. You've helped me. Uh, we've grown closer. Can we do what I've seen the other people do when I was looking into this information? Uh, like I saw people like Jane Roberts and Daryl Anka. And I said, can we do what they're doing? Can you come into my consciousness and share what you're sharing with me with other people? Because I think everyone who wants to know about this type of information should have access to it. And he said, yeah, of course we can do that. A couple of months of practice and I hit YouTube running and I shared and um, I, I basically did channeling for free uh, as a part of me just wanting to share uh, hundreds of videos for about four years until I came to a part of my life where it was like, okay, you have two choices now. You can quit channeling because your life is has 0% time for yourself. I was still taking care of my son with his severe needs. Uh, I was working a full-time job, not getting paid a lot, uh, but getting paid enough for my family and, and, and all the bills to take care of. Um, and then I would channel on my little bit of time I had off. So literally I would use my only free time to channel a few times a week for other people. So it's either quit channeling so you can have a life again, or quit doing this and start charging. So I did that. I took donations uh, for, for like uh, 30 minute sessions. And then I set a price for an hour session for people. And ever since then, I've been doing it for a living and um, it just, the, for the first four years I did it for free. I was like, if this information is helpful to anyone, one person, if one person can change their life about 10% of what I changed mine even if I do this for 10 years, doing a video a day for 10 years and only help one person, it's worth my time and effort because that's how convicted I felt with how much my life had shifted. And when I put this information out, just people flock to it. And I, you know, now I understand why they hear the value in truth. They hear the value in reflection. They hear when someone tells you that you're the most powerful person in your universe, or when someone tells you, you know, don't look to me for your answers, look at you for your answers. That's powerful. Not a lot of beings out there are saying that. Um, and even though in the channeling community, it's more common than, than it is around earth, it was still very profound. And at that time, there wasn't a ton of channelers on YouTube. Um, uh, so a lot of people came, a lot of people loved it. And a lot of people put in the uh, energy into co-creating. And here we are now, you know, 12, 13 years after I started publicly channeling. Wow, that's incredible. And it shows your your honor and your dedication to what you do as well, for, you know, doing it uh, four years for free for people, you know, because I appreciate it. Yeah, there, this community is really saturated with um, a lot of scammers and, and people that have no idea what they're talking about. And, and that's a, a big thing that people always say, well, if you have a gift or if you have something, then why don't you, uh, you know, give it away for free? Well, if you're a legit person and what you're doing is real, then you should be paid for it. That's the way that I look at it anyway. Right. Yeah. Well, this is a, this is one of the biggest problems in the community when it comes to this idea. Um, I felt very much uh, able to take care of sharing information with other people for free. I thought it was important for people to hear if they wanted to, if they found me, that meant they were there to do something with the information. 
whether it was listen to it and laugh and say, yeah, I knew channeling was fake or whether it was to say, wow, channeling is amazing. This guy uh, is able to channel this consciousness and this consciousness, whatever their experience was, they needed to be there. And I believe that and I still do. But I also had uh, my own house paid for and I also had my own cars paid for. You know, when my son was injured there, there was a settlement and that paid uh, for the house that we lived in and, and all the things. So I didn't have to do anything but go to work to pay the bills and go to work to get uh, certain things that his insurance wouldn't cover, things like that. So for me, I was like, you know what, this is great. And I still believe that good information should be accessible. But after I shared so much information, almost all of it was out there. Like not all of it, but, you know, the basic things that people would need to shift their lives was out there. And I kept online. I kept it for free. But then I noticed a pattern, too. Most people who would come for sessions weren't coming because they wanted to continue learning and growing and expanding. Most people at that time, uh, when I first started, were going because they didn't want to look through all the videos. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't want to do the they wanted the shortcut. Themselves. They wanted the, they shortcut, wanted the shortcut. Yes. And this is the thing. Do lawyers, doctors, uh, you know, anybody in those types of industries? Well, you know, you should be sharing. You're helping people. Why aren't you doing it free? People would laugh at you. They'd be like, why would you expect them? They went to college for, well, I spent multiple years meditating for eight, 12, 10 hours a day. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, you can channel too. Everyone can channel if they try. And I know it sounds stupid. I know people say that's probably not true, but it, everyone channels already. There are different levels of channeling. What I do is what my wife Kalina calls fancy channeling, right? It's I go deep. Uh, I connect with consciousness that's outside of me. So it's very extensive, uh, a higher level of channeling. But you are channeling when you're talking to a guest and you're feeling this motivation to just speak about a subject whether you know about that that subject a lot or not, when you're doing your investigations and an intuition takes you into a new place and you just start uh, figuring all this stuff out, that's a form of channeling. People who create music and sitting there with their eyes closed and they're just jamming on the guitar, they'll tell you, I don't know if that was two minutes of playing guitar, if it was an hour, I just felt it and I went, I don't remember, I just went. That's, That's a higher form of channeling too. So everybody does it. And people can do it at the level I do if they dedicated a long time. I think I had a natural opening in my consciousness, which helped me get there in a couple of years instead of multiple years or a decade or a couple decades, uh, like it would take a lot of other people, I think, to do. But the fact is everyone could do it. Nobody wants to dedicate the time to it. Nobody wants to make the shifts in their life to do it. So that's why they come to do that. And, And I'm not saying that's all people, but that's a lot of people especially back then when I was charging such a low price. And then I figured that out and I'm like, you know, uh, what really shifted it for me in, in the way that I, I stopped donations at the point too, because this lady was like, I can only afford to give you like 15 bucks. And I was like, all right, that's fine. You know, if that's all you can afford, that's all you can afford. And the next time I went to have a session with her, she's like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I couldn't make it last week. Cause she rescheduled. Uh, I just got back from Paris uh, (laughs) yesterday and uh, you know, last week I was talking to this channeler and I knew that channeler, you know, I had worked with that channeler and he never gave away his channeling for free. He never did donations. You had to pay him and you had to pay him higher than most other channelers around. I'm like, so you have enough money to, to buy a session from this guy and go to Paris, but you can't give me more than 15 bucks for something that a lot of people were giving me anywhere from 60 to 200 dollars for just depending on how much they had um so that's where i saw this is a a place where where uh, people are going to take advantage of me and because i'm nice and because i i don't uh i don't like to argue with people i don't like confrontation because of my past self i used to be a very violent person i don't like that part of me to be anywhere close to an activated level um i stay away from that so when that happened, I did the session and I never gave her one again. Um, There's always going to be someone that comes in and ruins it for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. And it wasn't just her, though. It was a lot of people. But that, that's the mindset in the community. Well, if you're doing something spiritual, you should 
Jesus did it for free. Well, Jesus also had 12 people following him around, taking care of all of his, his physical needs. He didn't have children. He didn't have a house that he had to pay for. It, it wasn't the same back then as it is now. Um, you know, money was a necessity to live back there. You, you could go out in the, in the desert and live off the desert or go into the caves or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you probably <laughs> you still could do that now, but uh, yeah. uh you know what I mean? It's not the same thing. It'd be much, um, way much more difficult to do that. Unfortunately, money, money kind of runs everything. Now it's it's influenced our entire way of life. You yeah, know, I, I really think that if money wasn't an option and we didn't have this uh, corrupt, you know, money laundering system, because that's basically what it all is. Whenever it comes down to the government and stuff, it's all just a money laundering system, right? They'll just uh, give a big, huge chunk to a charitable foundation and just goes directly right back into their pocket, right? Yeah. So if we didn't have this uh, kind of money control system, I think the things would be a lot better. You know, we would actually be doing things out of the the goodness of our heart. I mean, whenever you look back at all these ancient structures and, uh, you know, these megaliths and and architecture from back even uh, four or 500 years ago, you know, what drove those people to make those kinds of buildings? I guarantee you it wasn't driven by a monetary system. It couldn't be because look, look around us right now, look at the kind of buildings that we build now that's based on a monetary system. They're garbage. Yeah. They're ugly and they fall apart. Yeah. So what were they working off of back then? I highly doubt it was any form of a monetary system. So they had to be doing it a different way, right? I think we need to get back and find out what that different way was. Yeah, I think back then, uh, maybe not the system that created it, but the reasoning for the system was a lot different. Back then, there wasn't that religious dogma as much. Now, five, six hundred years ago, yeah, but we're talking like Giza pyramids uh, and the Indian temples and, and all these places that barely still exist from 10,000, 20,000 years ago that were just amazing. We couldn't reproduce them today if we tried. Back then, those people didn't believe that if you die, you go to heaven or hell uh, or have atheism or whatever. What they believed was the way that I live eternally is through my actions. So I am going to build this amazing thing. And every person who worked on it felt the same way. I am going to be a part of history in this one brick that I put here. Um, that's a very profound thing, you know, if you think about it. Uh, I know people say, well, what legacy have you left? And people are like, legacy, what are you, a narcissist? But everybody should have a legacy. Everybody should have something that they've given to the planet when they're gone that will remain, whether it's through your children, whether it's through friends, whether it's through music, uh, channeling, art, whatever you can put in this earth that will outlast you in your life is your legacy. That's your way to, for, for the personality that is you to live on eternally. Um, and, you know, I, I want to bridge this back to, to what we were talking about earlier too. Um, with the whole thing, the, the, the feeling of wanting people to have access to information too. Um, I think for me, that's part of what I want to leave behind. That's another reason I've left all my videos ever since you know, like when I first started channeling, I was, I wasn't good at it. Um, I had just got started. So it took me about three years to get pretty good at channeling. So everything from that point, like 2013 on forward, I've left online and I've kept it there and I've never turned it private or unlisted. I've just let people have access to it. Um, I don't remember anything that something embarrassing could be on there. Uh, I could have been talking with my ex-wife about something. It could have been anything, but I don't care. It's there. And, and it's accessible. Um, what you do, you bring communication to people on a bunch of different topics and educate people. That education motivates these people in their life to either shift something they're doing, the way they see something, uh, how they uh, approach life. And who knows? I'm sure you've gotten an email in your time on the air saying, hey, you know, something you said or a guest you had or just watching your show has helped me do this and shift this and be this in my life. Um, so that's your legacy, you know, and it will live on beyond you. And if all of us put our heart into what we're doing and, and put something into an excitement, we can all have that. And then, you know, that's our keys of pyramid, I think. 
I agree 100%. And the, the funny thing about those kinds of emails is they always come at the best time, right? They always come whenever you're feeling really down or you're feeling like shit, you know, surrounding something or you're having a bad day or something, you know, and, and they send you an email and I appreciate them so much, you know, like they, they've taken their time out of their day to either send me a message on Facebook or on Instagram or send me a long email to, you know, tell me how much they, they appreciate me, you know, and that's very, really uplifting because people don't realize how much, and I've talked about it before. And we talked a little bit about it before uh, we started the show today, how much work goes into creating these shows. You know, there's a, a lot of time and a lot of effort goes into these. And, and it seems like for sometimes very little reward, you know, and I know that you have felt that too. I think a lot of content creators have felt that way, but it just seems like it at the time when really, you don't really know how many people you, you are uh, impacting, you know, cause I recently found out that people have been taking my shows down and putting them on different platforms, you know, that I'm, uh, that I'm not even aware of. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, do it. You know, I'm not, but heard about it, you know, if that gets the word out and what I'm doing to somebody else for somebody else that they can listen to on a different platform that I'm not, you know, currently on, then, you know, do it. You're, you're free to do that. So, yeah, I really, uh, I really appreciate the, the community and the amount of people that um, actually do support our work, but I wanted to switch gears here a, a little bit though, Rob, because, it's interesting that you say that you're a ET channeler, right? But in your in your bio, it talks about them being guides, right? And then you just uh, refer to Treb as being a uh, interdimensional being. So, what exactly are they, Rob? Are they ETs? Are they your higher self, your guides? Uh, what is it? What what's actually going on here because i think there's a lot of confusion surrounding this whole thing yeah there there is a ton of confusion the reason there's confusion is because everyone has different terms for the same thing um or different things for different terms and it's really confusing like some people use the word dimension in a whole other way than trevor Ardiff would share it. a higher self means something way different to a lot of people um you know, despite how much Trev and Ardiff have, have kind of explained their own terminology, it's still hard for people because they're exposed to it in so many places for so many different things. So first of all, Trev. Trev is fifth density consciousness. He's a, he's a fifth density being who lives in the fifth density, which is six dimensional, which is like two layers dimensionally above us. That's why I call him extra dimensional because he lives in a dimension uh, more than ours so extra dimensional he's also extraterrestrial by our own terms because he doesn't live on earth and terrestrial being earth uh, so he is more than earth he's outside of earth so he's also an extraterrestrial but he's also uh, within the same oversoul as my own consciousness which means he has the possibility of being a future version of myself a parallel version of myself or whatever. Now the oversoul thing is a bit complex, but the way that they have shared it and kind of assimilated the information down to me is the oversoul is a large consciousness that holds millions of lifetimes. So, you know, we're talking, not just talking human lifetime, we're talking about animals, plants, trees, rocks, but also higher dimensional consciousnesses. So all of the Trebs and Ardiffs and, and, you know, high to like third to sixth density consciousnesses, as well as the, the first and second density. So anything that can uh, leave their body, anything that can die, anything that can shift out of what they are, go back into this place, this oversoul, and then come back through another lifetime, whether it's through incarnating physically, whether it's staying in the oversoul and, and assisting others by being a guide, whatever the case is, the oversoul is that place that everything goes back to. Uh, and, and then you choose your next path forward. So 
the reason I call Trevon RF my guides is because even though they are extra dimensional and extraterrestrial, um, the guides are a more generic term for beings who exist above my dimension that help me. Now there are spirit guides and those are different. A, a guide and a spirit guide, at least through the terminology of Trevon RF, are different. Uh, a spirit guide is a being that exists that most likely is human. Or if you're a starseed, let's say you incarnate from another planetary system and you come here to do whatever. You know, there are draconian starseeds that come to mess shit up and there are Assyrian starseeds that come to make themselves feel better than humans or, or to help humans, depending. Uh, there's a lot of different of those. And even their guide, their uh, like spirit guides, the ones that work with them, um, are usually human, but can be uh, else, elsewise, you know? Um, the difference, the main difference between the spirit guide and a regular guide, spirit guides don't work from a physical place. They're non-physical consciousness and they work directly with you. So let's say I'm having a rough time and I feel a motivation just to be lighthearted, right? So my actual heart energy is affected. This uh, spirit guide is internally connecting with my consciousness, helping me on an internal energetic level. They're actually in, intergrained with my consciousness to help me get through the life on earth. Life on earth is hard. You need help. Um, and that's what they do, but they don't, they don't force their way through. They only assist doing the things that you're already wanting to do. Hey, I want to feel better. Here's the energy to help feel better. And there's usually a couple, two or three of them, sometimes four or five, but usually only about three. And they all deal with different themes that you go through in your life. Um, Trev and Art have compare everything to chakra systems. So if you understand Eastern philosophy, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, and you know what a chakra is, uh, they're little energy centers in your body, but more importantly, they're also themed. And the, those themes are tied to the dimensional themes of evolution that you go through as a soul through the different dimensional energies too. So one of those internal spirit guides will work with a certain set of chakras, most likely like the first or first, second, and third chakras work together because those are lower earth-based energies, or maybe the third eye chakra, crown chakra, throat chakra, because those are higher dimensional energies. And maybe the heart chakra alone, because the heart is the most important right now for the part of evolution we're on. Right now we're humans. Knowing ourself was what we're supposed to have mastered by now. We haven't, so we're keeping to try that. But the next phase is, is to go to connections. Uh, as a theme for the soul. So we're going to connections and that is the heart. Uh, you know, I connect to you and I feel that as a sense of companionship, friendship, love, whatever, that's from the heart directly. So these guides work with those specific themes and energy centers in your system as a spirit guide, where a guide can be any Tom, Dick, Harry uh, out there in the universe who's trying to to connect with you, but most of the time they're coming from the oversoul. Most of the time they're having a theme in their soul's journey that is similar or exactly like yours. And that's why you're linked up together. So if, if I listen to the way Artif and Treb describe it, if I die today and say, okay, this incarnation's done, I would integrate more with my higher self, which is the part of me that's not in my body, the part that's higher in dimension. And I would say, okay, what's next? Well, Trev is part of my oversoul. So is artist. So now I'm going to go experience that life of being them. And then I could go experience that life directly. And I know it sounds uh, really complex and convoluted and a little all over the place with the types of crazy that's there, but these are, are, some of the ways that they've described that help people understand the terminology better. You know, a soul, some person says that's all of what you are. Some people say that's just what lives in the body. Uh, these terms, I mean, we need to get together as a community and just come with a, a book and say, this is, these are the terms and we're going to all agree <laughs> or something because <laughs> it's the most confusion is caused by the different use. Even Trevon Art, if uh, I've channeled beings outside of them, many, lots of different ET beings. 
um, or EDs or, or whatever. And when I channel them, they'll use different terms for the same description. I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that. People just getting used to the, what trepanographers are saying. Now they're going to use the term dimension for what Trevor Ardiff would call a matrix or something like that. And I'm like, oh my God, guys. Uh, so yeah, it's a problematic thing, not just in the community, but even inside of myself. So yeah, I think that's Long where answer. a lot of the uh, where a lot of the confusion really comes in. And then we take, you know, what people are talking about to mean one thing when it really means something different. And then we have a like a ascension, right? Everyone for the past like four or five years has been talking about ascension and how we're going to ascend into the fifth dimension. And the whole planet's going, and we're going to be going physically, right? And that's a fairy tale pipe dream. It's not happening. It's it's not logical. Uh, the the ascension is an after death ascension. The ascension is kind of exactly like what you're talking about. Whenever you go back to your oversoul, and then you're able to choose and pick where you go. I think that that had something to do with this reincarnation trap or this reincarnation matrix that was kind of placed here that is no longer active. That's been taken down, and that's been. Uh, misinterpreted to mean that we're all going to ascend physically into the fifth dimension, new earth, and everything is going to be love, peace, and light. Yeah, it's, you know, the, and these things too, a lot of different views on it. My my own personal perspective and everything Trevenar have told me, it, it can't happen to the whole planet at once. It can happen internally to some people who really connect to their inner self, you know, like people who are already highly psychic and already have done all the work, they can have an experience that's higher in dimensionality because that limitation, like you were saying, is off, but it's very rare. It happens maybe a couple of times in a generation for people to, to achieve that. This is like the Jesuses and Buddhas that really shifted into that energy. If you want the whole earth to be that you have to go through multiple generations of being better with that restriction gone. You have to go in willingly as an incarnation into earth and, and do the game on your own accord, not because you're told to, not because you believe that that's what you should not because you're forced to be whatever the case that people perceive you should be willing to go back to earth and say, you know what, I want another shot at this and I want to do better and then create better while you're there with less restrictions and less energy. So yeah, I think you're right. A lot of people expected that overnight shift and, and it really killed our community in 2012 because a lot of, a lot of channelers were saying, Oh yeah, it's coming. They'll be, they'll be in your front yard, you know, free med beds for everybody, same stuff they're doing now, but just a little different, you know, we're taking down the cabal, don't worry, guys, you know, you only have to deal with a few hurricanes and massive pole shifts, but we got you, <laughs> you know, and famine and the collapse of our society, but everything's going to be okay. Yeah, don't, don't worry, we got you. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you, uh, <laughs> we'll give you nuclear pills. We'll send those out right away. <laughs> well, this is the thing it's people stop acting. And I think that's why radiation pills, sorry. <laughs> yeah no absolutely i think that's why these people or beings you know maybe they are negative beings too that in some ways that are, are coming through people as positive channel but i think most of it is this energy of manipulation from a person to person level and i think the infiltration of our communities is a real thing I, i'm not i'm not doing the whole you know, I know people are like, that sounds awfully conspiracy theorist. First of all, I, I hate that term because it, it, it tries to downgrade a human who sees a pattern outside of normal. You know what I mean? Uh, JFK, that, you know, that was a, a, a whole thing, a conspiracy theory, but there are lots of people who've shown pathways outside of the normal 9-11, same thing even just as recently as the last few years um, when the government says one thing and then it's proven to not be something up until that moment, it's proven everyone before who believes in it is called that so that they're disengaged. But I'm, I'm not going into conspiracy land, 
you know, when people say that our communities, UFO communities, uh, truth or movement communities, even prepper communities at this point, they're all being infiltrated to give bad information. And it's not something new, it's been happening forever, but there really seems to be an intense level of push on almost all communities at this point to get information and to disempower people. And I think that whole Galactic Federation of Light uh, in the early 2010s, that was the way to do it at the channeling metaphysical spiritual community, just like some of the characters that we saw who was doing the other side of that, like the White Hats will defeat everyone and the Cabal will be taken down, just like they were doing in the conspiracy community or the UFO communities. And then you had people mixing the two up and, and bring that bridge together to get bigger groups of people to, to listen. So I, I think that's real. I, I, you know, I'm not dumb. Um, I know people are, are able to be just greedy and maybe they want to make money by lying. Of course, that's, that's probably more common than it should be. But I also know that to get people to buy a story so that they stop doing the things they need to, to better themselves or stop motivating spiritual growth on a personal level, then you've got something there. If you really want people not to grow into understanding themselves in the world around them, it's the best way to tell them, don't worry, we got you. We'll take care of everything while they sit back and wait. I agree. And I think that there's a, even a bigger psyop that's going on within the community too. And, you know, we have all these people that are, you know, everyone's always screaming contact, contact, contact. We need disclosure, you know? And it's like, it's almost like they're, they're waiting for a UFO to land in the middle of their backyard. Right. And ETs walk out or they land in the, the white house lawn, you know? And, uh, you know, they're like, we're here. And then they give us all this uh, free technology and all these, uh, you know, great and wonderful things. Well, the first thing that I'm thinking is, what have we done on this planet to deserve something like that? Right? Yeah. Because I'd say a truly advanced civilization would have, you know, honor and pride. They wouldn't just, you know, uh, land and, you know, give a fairly primitive uh, species, you know, the secrets to the universe, right? And I don't yeah. think that we've done anything of note, right? We've done nothing but destroy the planet and kill ourselves in endless wars. So why would any advanced species of beings come to this planet and give us anything just solely based on our behavior, right? And then secondly, too, I believe, and this is just my personal belief, is I don't believe that what we call ETs are physical beings, right? They're, they're consciousness beings or in a spiritual phenomenon, right? And they deliver information to the people that they contact, like they've contacted you and you channel them, right? I think that any physical ET that would be here on the planet has either been created here or is indigenous to earth and has lived here uh, for a really long time. And that doesn't make them extraterrestrial, right? So if the government ever rolls out a, an ET and puts it on display, you know, it's a hoax, right? And you know that it's created here and that, because that makes them terrestrial. And even the, the earth-based reptilians, which you have a lot of uh, knowledge uh, surrounding earth-based reptilians, you know, they're not extraterrestrial either. They're, they're terrestrial. They've been here probably since the beginning. Yeah. Right? Long before we were, that's for sure. <laughs> and, it, and they might be extraterrestrial to us based on their looks. Right. But right. other than that, they're not from off the planet. Right. And that's what extraterrestrial means. You just mentioned that uh, earlier. Yeah. And, and I don't believe that they are harmful to, to us humans i mean maybe some factions some of the some factions of the earth-based reptilians might be you know harmful if you stumble upon their uh, uh you know their base they would probably be you know hostile but i believe that a majority of them just want to live in peace with us and uh share the planet i know that was a lot uh sorry to mm -hmm. ramble on there a little bit but what's your thoughts 
No, I agree. I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, even though a couple of perspectives are slightly different, I think for the majority, uh, the energy between the reptilian beings, the earth reptilians and humans uh, is one that is uh, based in fear and contentiousness and, and horror. But I think you're right. I think just like humans, because they live on earth and everything that lives on earth has to have an earthly energy behind it, right? Like we live here as humans and what is our experience? We have really amazing, good people and really horrible, horrifying, uh, psychopathic, sociopathic people. So I think that wild spectrum is just an earth theme, right? So I think these beings that are uh, dr not draconian, but the earth reptilian beings, they're definitely like that, but just like humans, most humans want to do good or want to be good. It's the psychopaths with countries that they rule that are the ones pulling the trigger on the wars, uh, billionaires and corporations that are polluting everything and dumping waste and killing animals and flooding the sea with plastic. Me and you, you know, we might litter a little bit, you know, by throwing out something that we could have recycled, you know, and a lot of people doing that a little bit would still cause a big issue, but these corporations could have easily made these little plastic rings from uh, dissolvable cardboard, something that wouldn't harm the environment, something with natural ink, something that people would accept because people don't care. People are self-interested. And even though people want to be good, at the end of the day, they want to take care of their little group that they're with, their family, their friends, whatever. So if you tell them, you know, hey, I can make you a product, it'll be a little more expensive, but, you know, you don't have to walk out in your yard and see a bunch of garbage from your neighbors because it'll melt away in a week. People would be like, you know what, that's fine. And if you take everything off the market and just put things like that, then people are forced to do that. They've done that a million times with a million products. Why not do it now? right? They don't want to because that would take more money from their pocket. So it's just a cycle. And that's the mentality here on earth. And I think reptilians from earth mimic that there's a small, small group of those really offset, really jerk, <laughs> jerk behavior uh, types of beings. And then there are a lot of them who just want to exist, just want to live, you know, and from what I've understood, uh, the way that reptilians see humans, most of them don't care about humans besides the fact that they, they fear the imbalance from humans. Because even though they have that spectrum in their race, each individual is pretty solid, right? You might have a psychopath here and a good person there, but they're always gonna be a psychopath and always gonna be a good person. Where humans, you can get a good person and a psychopath in one body. And it depends on what time of week or what they're going through of what side you're going to get that scares them. Um, so a lot of them are hands off, but there are larger groups uh, within the reptilian community on earth that do care about humans that want to build a bridge and the ones who don't care about them because they're afraid of them. Most of those would easily accept humans if we came to them in, in a loving way without threats, without uh, craziness. If we could stop killing each other on the surface, I'm sure they would pay attention really quickly. And a lot of them would probably shift their minds overnight. You know, maybe not overnight, but within a year, within a, a couple of years, uh, I think it's possible. I think it's achievable. And I think you're right too, the, the, the extraterrestrial thing, um, I don't think as many visit Earth as people think. I think more are involved in the etherical realms. Uh, that's why physical contact is, is such a difficult thing. And, and, you know, you may be right. And this is the thing, I, I don't dismiss any possibility. I believe uh, Trebinard, if share with me, is from their best perspective and their best understanding. Uh, and I trust what they say, but I'm not close to everything else. So when you've shared the couple of things that you have shared with me about what you, what you think is happening on the earth, I'm definitely open to that. Uh, I'm definitely open to anything, you know, I'm sitting here talking to these beings, uh, multidimensional beings. And, you know, two years before that, I would have laughed myself, 
my head off. If I would have saw a video of me in the future channeling, I'd have been like, what, what drug did I get into? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, when you think about it, Rob, what's the easiest way to cover up any kind of highly advanced technology that we might have? The easiest way to do it is to blame it on something else. True. And to blame it on a ET threat or spin the ET narrative, right? Because see, there, there's, there's a lot of confusion everywhere. And we've talked about some of the confusion within the community and the spiritual community and channeling community, but the extraterrestrial topics are just as confusing. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have lumped things together that don't belong together, right? Like the, the UFOs and the ETs. When I believe that the UFO phenomena isn't even connected to aliens or ETs, because again, I think that the ETs are non-physical beings, like you're talking about, they exist in a different dimension, in a, in a different realm, and they contact us through our consciousness, right? And the physical contact is done by something else, right? And there's only one thing left over when you take ETs out of the, the picture, and that's us. That's humans yeah. and that's our military. And yeah, that and, makes sense. And a lot of the things that I've heard from Trevor Nardiff do indicate that a lot of the time people see sightings, they're mistaken. Uh, what they're seeing as UFOs for either human technology or just mistaken in general. Like they see an airplane and don't understand it's an airplane because they don't know enough about airplanes at night with a shining light or whatever it is. But a lot of the times when they're seeing these extraordinary things, and Trevor Nardiff alluded to that too many times, their perspective is a little different than, than what you said. They, they say that there is contact here on earth from ETs, but most of it is interdimensional. So they're shifting from their dimension down, connecting quickly and going away. Because if they, if they permeate here, if they land a ship and stay here and stay in this little dimension, the military will come out immediately. Almost every country uh, has an agreement with one of the larger countries, USA, whoever, that if anything comes into your airspace, uh, you contact us immediately and we'll have jets over there like that. Um, so that, that's about the only difference. But I, you know, I'm open to that idea completely too, because I've also seen the TR-3B and, and some of these other crafts that the military definitely have. And Trepan Artif has said, in some instances, their technology is 150 to 200 years more advanced than what we did when, when we're always told the military is about 20 years ahead of everyone else. Yeah, times 10. Um, so, yeah, I, I believe it. I believe it. It's very possible. I mean, the government has... Uh has always said, you know, after every incident, right, every big incident, uh, Battle of LA, 1943, or it might have been 1942, I think it was 1943, but um, in Roswell, 1947, Washington Flap event, 1962, they all come out after every one of these events, and they state to the public that they have no reason to believe that it was extraterrestrial, right? Which I think that they're telling the truth. So if it's not extraterrestrial, then it only leaves one thing, right? It means that it's it's terrestrial and it's our technology and that's the cover up, right? And that it's been us this entire time and that we've developed these uh, technologies, right? Yeah, or it's another race that lives here on earth and yeah. they are where have advanced superior technology it makes sense yeah i don't yeah. know that's just kind of what i've been playing with because you know it's awfully strange and awfully odd that they've covered it up for so long right they've covered up this phenomenon for so long what was the purposes of you know covering it up and then all of a sudden 70 years later coming on and saying oh yeah they're Turns out we were wrong. You know, you guys were right. You know, what's the purpose of that? Other than the UFOs or what they've rebranded them as, as UAPs now, 
actually being us or another country and then the people not uh, not wanting the public to know that we've developed and that we've had this highly advanced technology for a really long time. I mean, it, ETs and uh, aliens have been accepted for a really long, for a long time now in the, in the consciousness. I mean, shoot, we have, you know, uh, History Channel has, you know, ancient, even though it's a bunch of bullshit, you know, they still put the idea and still put the thought out there. I mean, it's been accepted for a really, really long time. I mean, even people that I never thought would believe in extraterrestrials or, you know, aliens actually believe in it now. But I think that that in itself, the belief that they're actually coming here from outside of our planet is a PSYOP. And that's the whole, uh, that's that's the cover-up to a degree. And But I do... I think that there are uh, species of beings like I was, you know, referring to earlier and like we were talking about the, you know, the, the earth-based reptilians and maybe some other kind of indigenous species that's lived on the planet that has some kind of, uh, you know, highly advanced technology and that can leave the planet and, and maybe come back. And maybe there has been some extraterrestrial visits to the planet, but I think that they are very, 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 very rare. And I think it's maybe one or two uh, in every 4,000 years, maybe once every age, we get uh, a couple of real extraterrestrials visiting our planet. But that's just my personal thoughts. And, and again, I'm open to uh, everything too. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to get your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that because a lot of the things that I've heard from people are resonating around this because that's the big question right why why now are they saying okay yes guys you got us ha 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 they they're ets why now a lot of people have theorized that the beings who had come from long long ago the ones who kind of came and gave knowledge and left and there were like paintings and and statues and, and hieroglyphs made of these beings they're saying, you know, a lot of people in our community believe because they're coming back because those gods from the sky, the aliens, the ETs that came and gave life to humans or shifted life in humans, the Anunnaki or whoever, whatever, they believe that they're coming back and the government knows that they're coming back and the government can't stop them from coming back. So they need to be able to put something out to explain that. And then they can say, well, they're real, but look, they're hostile. You know, they're coming here without asking us and, and they're doing this and that. And look, they're attacking the military, you know, whatever the case is. So there's a lot of beliefs out there right now centered around that. And that's interesting. You know, I asked Trevin Art if in there, this is the problem with communicating with type one beings. I love Treb and Artif to death. They have, like I said, Treb shifts in my life. Artif's added to that shift and the insight and information they give it is phenomenal. But like uh, when I was talking to Chris last night, they are more there for the internal experience, not the external. When I start asking questions about, hey, what happened in the 1940s when World War II was over? What happened with this and that? They're like, this part of the collective energy is what they can read. They can't go into a certain person's thought process um, without their permission. They, they, they won't act upon someone against their free will. So they can only read what the co collective reads. And if all of people on earth say, oh yeah, you know, this happened during uh, World War I, or this happened during the Vietnam War, or hey, this happened during Napoleon's expedition to, to wherever, that's what they're going to pick up on first. And even though they can see if that energy has a basis in it playing out in the reality, uh, if it's something that goes against the grain, they might not talk about it because it would go against the will or the free will of the people who have belief on that. And it's a severe example, but things like that. Um, so it's very hard to get answers on certain subjects from them, especially about that. And this is why I, I do a lot of pondering in these things myself. A lot of people are like, why don't you just ask Trevor Narnif? Well, I do, and I have, and I will continue to. But the answers they give on those types of things can be limiting 
because they're connecting to all of the consciousnesses when they're reading something about earth, they kind of have to. Um, so, so it's a, it's a thing. If that's what is happening, if there are beings who are coming back to earth, um, you know, maybe they, they wouldn't appreciate these governments uh, overlooking all the people and taking away their free will and making them jump through loops when, you know, they created laws for early humans that said you will have freedom to be sovereign, you will have freedom to be free or whatever. So maybe they would come and attack the militaries, who knows? Uh, a lot of interesting ideas are out there though right now. And like you said, being open to all of them and just waiting to see how it pans out is, is definitely one way to do it. Um, that's what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting about these these beings coming back. But again, I don't know if they are extraterrestrial or not, right? I don't know. I've really defined my whole ideas and my whole thoughts around extraterrestrials, you know, and I think a majority of them are just highly advanced humans, right? And they were on the, because we've had all these ancient texts and a lot of these, you know, um, ancient hieroglyphs, the Sumerian, um, Sumerian text, uh, Sumerian tablets and stuff talking about these beings that would, that would come and then they would leave and then they would come back and then they would leave again. And some people have theorized this is around a, some kind of cycle or some kind of disaster or a natural disaster that the planetary cycle automatically goes through every so many thousands of years. So if they were here a really long time ago, and then a natural disaster happens and then they leave or they go underground because there's a lot of, uh, you know, theories and uh, texts and stuff about people that go underground. You know, the ant people coming up and saving people and taking them underground when a big natural cataclysm is about to happen. You know, so then it, it just lays credence to the fact that, you know, maybe a lot of this is all us and we've just labeled it something because we don't understand it right? it's just like people like the, the ufo phenomenon that we we're just talking about when people see something that they don't understand they see crazy lights in the sky they see some object that defies physics and gravity and all that they automatically assume the first thing that comes to their mind is that it's not from here yeah when it really more than likely is even Starlink. I mean, I've had a hundred people send me Starlink video and said, Oh my God, did, uh, we had a hundred UFOs come over. It's like, Oh, it's Starlink. That's pretty, uh, pretty earth based. <laughs> you know, that's uh, Elon Musk toys. Um, even that, because it's not something everyone sees every day. You know what I mean? So that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, and I'm not trying to ask you questions. I know it's your show. I, I know you got a director, but I, I wanted to ask you if you've heard, of the theory um, where people say that when you look out at the moon, that the moon is actually a reflection of the planet that we're living on. And we're just living in one of the small craters and each crater is uh, its own planet. And when you go to Antarctica, that's where the gate is that lets you out to the rest of the world. So you can go to the rest of these other parts of our world mm -hmm. with different races and, uh, that it's when it's frozen it stays over there but when uh it's not frozen it's opened up and that reflection of the moon uh this guy who created this theory or who uh i don't know if he heard it from somewhere else and adapted or what but he actually shows a couple of craters on the moon and there you've got a very similar shape to the north america south america uh europe asia continent outline right across there if the earth were laid out flat you know what i mean so there's a lot of things that happen on this planet that i'm sure you know we will never know and a lot of things that we can find out uh with the right type of digging but to me all of this is on the table um as weird as that sounds even though logically i don't think that that is uh, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, uh, my intuition says no, what Trevin Artifice said was no, uh, but still, is that possible? Sure. You know, um, 
And it actually has a lot, the whole thing. And this is the thing, people can't even agree if we're on a flat earth or a round earth. And this is amazing because I, I was like, you know, I'm open to whatever. So I dive in and there's so many things that are convincing. And then uh, a couple of things that are dismissive and that happens both ways. Like, hey, this is really good, really good, really good. Oh, but this kind of disproves everything. And then you go to the other model and say, this, this, this is convincing. Oh, this disproves. How can you both have positive uh, answers for both when they're drastically different? And I think this tells us more about the multidimensionality of consciousness that we are as much as it has to do with the way the shit is weird physically. I think as souls, we play that game in the matrix where we're creating shit ourselves too. And I think that has a big, big part of how we see the greater environment, even if it's something that we're thinking is there or something that we're actually creating. I, I don't know how directly that is per person. But I would imagine that it has a lot of influence on the way that we take in what we see at bare minimum, you know? Absolutely. You just explained it the best when you were talking about uh, communicating with Treb and Art of uh, that they see things based on the human collective, right? So if we, we could all believe in one thing and they would pick up on that and they would communicate it to you as being true, even though it might not be true. So that's how par powerful our beliefs and our thoughts and our ideas really are. Our beliefs, thoughts, and ideas literally shape our reality, right? And it can bring things into our reality that uh, we want or what we don't want. And I think that that's an important part of always trying to be positive and have positive thoughts and flipping those, those negative, uh, you know, thought patterns that you have to create a positive reality. It's an individual thing. We have to do this on an individual basis. Right. And yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. There's this ge gentleman that, um, uh, he had runs a YouTube channel called archaics and he talks about this AI God that, uh, his name is Jason Bashars, and he talks about this AI God that's kind of in charge of our reality, and then it just duplicates things in our reality based on our beliefs and our perceptions in that, right? So if you saw a, let's see, randomly, like, no one had ever heard of Bigfoot before. I'm just using this as an example, right? No, no one had ever heard of a Bigfoot, but someone sees a Bigfoot, right? And then they go tell their friends, they go and tell their family and they convince them of what they saw. And then all of a sudden, all of these other people are start seeing Bigfoot, right? Because of the perception and the belief based off of that one sighting, whether it was actual Bigfoot or not, has duplicated it in our reality and continuously perpetuated it. And I think that that's the way all of this works, right? No one ever talked about aliens or ETs uh before World War II or UFOs. UFOs were never talked about before World War II, right? I mean, you know, people weren't concerned about it, right? So it's something that's duplicating it in our reality based off of our perception and our belief. That's fascinating. I love that. That makes so much sense too of why the, the hundredth mon monkey effect works, why uh, shared dreams and aspects that relate to that uh they they've had records of people having dreams like premonition dreams and then something occurs well maybe it's not a premonition maybe it's a, a collaboration of creation with these people um yeah that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense i i yeah i never thought of it that way but that's very valid concept you know i i see how that could play out very very easily <laughs> yeah i think and it's you know about you know being open i mean people have uh I've, i talked about that a lot but he, he just kind of put it into a different uh a different way and a different reality he had a bunch of different examples uh you know on his channel about how one one country you know don't quote me because uh it was just you know i was listening to it while i was doing something else you know how we do we listen to podcasts while we're cleaning the room or you know taking a shower or whatever he was talking about this country that realized uh, and he said that he, he talked about the document had the documentation and everything he talked about this country that one day someone realized that there wasn't any insects 
anywhere. The insects had disappeared, right? And they started asking other people around. They were like, hey, have you noticed uh, there's not any insects? We don't have any insects. There's not any bugs. There's not any flies. There's, you know, where are they, where are they all at? And then once enough people realized that the insect, that there was no insects there, all of a sudden they got flooded with a shit ton of insects that were basically falling from the sky. Wow. Right? And he like, you know, correlates this to that. It's some kind of, that we're living in some sort of uh, holographic simulation. And when someone realizes, whenever the simulation screws up and someone realizes uh, that the simulation is screwed up, the simulation overcompensates for itself and then just dumps whatever it is that they screwed up on into our reality. I don't know. Super, super That's interesting amazing. and weird. <laughs> well, it makes sense though. It's actually how a lot of computer programs run when there's a um, deficient code in, in a game, it will try to repeat that line of signal until it stops. And then when that code is needed again, when another player reaches a, a certain level or a certain area, or interacts in a certain way, then it'll come and just flood it again. And sometimes it hits and then creates double and triple and quadruple. So that actually makes a ton of sense. That's how our programs are written. A lot of them. Um, it's, you know, Trepanard, if without saying directly, yes, you live in a holographic dimensional universe, even though they've kind of used those words, they do say it's a projected matrix that the physical bodies are from the consciousness behind us. And we're projecting that into a physical playground, basically, for the souls that are experiencing to have an experience of physicality. That physicality is not a natural state of being. Uh, consciousness is. And the physicality is brought into uh, the experience of manifesting so that the soul can have the experience of being separate from each other. Cause as a soul, you know, the oversoul, it's all connected. That's how you can jump into any life you want after you leave your body and start gaining more connection to the higher part of your soul, your higher self and the higher uh, fractal consciousness. And once you do that, then you're going over uh, to those lifetimes that are closest to you, the trebs and artifs of myself or, or, you know, really close lifetimes that, that are meaningful to me, that would be highly possible. And then you keep growing and you have the possibility to do that. So if this is a physical projection only, and there's nothing real about it, it's all coding and program. Um, to me, this physical touch can be just as easily a program of consciousness than it is a physical realm to me it, it doesn't make as much of a difference because i think we're all here souls to experience this reality and if we do and we're going through the feelings of the experience that we can't really lose nothing uh if we're being true to ourselves and if we're going through the experience and, and open to feeling and seeing and uh, experiencing those new things that is kind of a win-win but regardless to me i think if this is like a literal program, digitally, holographically projected program. And there's a physical body somewhere else that's enjoying this, this one of many simulations. Uh, to me, it still doesn't mean it's any less meaningful. I can watch a movie and emotionally connect to a character. Me too. And when that character dies, I'm like, oh, I feel it. You know, and, and it's not because I want to dip in fantasy land. I know it's fake. I know it's uh, actors. I know it's Hollywood stunts, whatever. But that energy telling the story is the part that you're supposed to connect to. That's the reason it was meant to be written, you know, so that you can experience that. So if I'm experiencing it through a video game called Rob the Channeler, then that's what I'm doing. You know what I mean? And that's fine because I can live in this character now and be happy as long as I'm doing the shit that I feel is important to do to be happy. So I couldn't agree more, my friend. I mean, just because we're in a simulation doesn't make it doesn't make the experience any less important. Right? Yeah. And absolutely. I agree with you. And I, I 100% think that 
it's all about the experience and the duality and the polarity of the planet is what makes us special right because we can come in here and we can experience both sides both extremes we get to experience the the pain and the suffering and then on the opposite end we get to experience you know happiness and joy right and other places other beings in higher densities don't really get to experience what we experience here and that's what I think makes this planet and us being here uh, so enticing and, and beautiful. And, you know, and some people can hate it, you know what I mean? And some people can not like it, but I think that's also a part of the experience. Right. So I, I don't think people really realize what we have here in this opportunity that we have to be here on this planet. They always want to be someplace else. They want to always want to be doing someplace else and, and want what they can't have. And, and it, instead of uh, leaning into it, you know, and, and, dou and doubling down on uh, the things that, you know, make us special and being here to experience this, uh, this, this beautiful world. You know, because you, whenever you die and you go someplace else, you might not be able to experience the things that we experience here. I agree whole, wholeheartedly. And um, it, it's funny you say that the, the, the spectrum of the being, too, because uh, Art uh, and Trev have both said on occasions, you know, people say, why are ET so interested with Earth or why are extra dimensional so interested in Earth? They said you have the ability to do something not a lot of other places can do. You have this ability to go out and murder someone in cold blood in the morning. Like, just go out, murder for money. Go out and kill this person in the morning and go back and love your child and tuck them in and kiss them goodnight and feel the deepest connection you could ever feel. And that happens to the same person the same day that is not normal anywhere else. That's not a thing that happens. The spectrum uh, of someone who goes crazy and loses their shit and stabs one a hundred times can still have the deepest love in them for their children or mother or father or brothers and sister, whoever. And the same person has that capacity. That's not, you know, that's a, that's a thing that's very intense. And that's why I think a lot of people don't like it. You're right. And not everyone enjoys that as a possibility, but I think it's amazing. <laughs> I think so too. And I definitely agree with uh, uh, Trab and saying that no other place is, is like this, you know, and because I really don't think that other places in the universe or anywhere else that you would incarnate, is going to even compare to the experiences that we have here, you know? And I think that there's actually a, a long waiting list to probably get in here to experience this 3D physical reality. I mean, why else would anybody want to come? Why else are we here? We wouldn't be here, <laughs> you know, if we didn't kind of sign up to come, right? Right. Well, think about when you go to the theme parks, what's the most popular rides? The one that, that makes everybody scared the most. <laughs> and has the most ups and downs. Right? Yep. <laughs> it goes like this <laughs> and circles back around. <laughs> That's very a, true. There's <laughs> a uh, whoop de whoop and a little flip in there. But uh, thanks so much, Rob. I really appreciated uh, the conversation. Uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to mention uh, before we go? If not, uh, let people know where people can find you online. And if they wanted to uh, sign up for a channeling, uh, something like that, let them know where they can do that. All right. Well, I appreciate being here. Uh, it's always a great time with you, brother. And you're going to be coming on my show too soon, which is going to be great. Um, we're going to be able to, to have a talk on the other side of it too which is always great um but for me not much to share uh we, we do have something we've worked on for a little bit that we're getting ready to release it's a course on uh, human sexuality and sexuality in general multi-dimensional sexuality but mostly focus on healing sexual trauma which is a huge thing on earth um men and women 
old and young. We, we are all kind of in that realm of, of sexual trauma. We're doing that, but uh, all, all of that you can find on the website. Uh, if you put up on the mailing list, you'll get updates as we get new stuff in. Uh, and ET Whisper uh, on YouTube, um, hundreds of videos to watch for free. You can get, you can spend a thousand hours over there watching videos if you really wanted to to dig through uh, whatever's there. So yeah, just look around. Uh, that would be great. And what I want to share with everybody is, uh, you know, my own personal perspective is that uh, right now a lot of a lot of people are having. Uh, realizations and overcoming a lot of the disconnection and that's been happening years before uh, and part of that overcoming is joining with others and, and forming communities so I think it's really important for everyone to come together and, and talk to people that you wouldn't normally agree upon things and uh, meet with people who have different perspectives because it's really important to, to share thoughts and, and ideas right now with each other um, the bad ideas have a way of ten, tendency of floating themselves out if people are openly able to communicate about it. Uh, and right now the rest of the world doesn't want that open dialogue. So talk to each other talk to people who think the opposite of you and be open to what they have to say. You know, who knows? It could change your life. You could change theirs. So that was beautiful, brother. Thank you so much. I really highly implore people to check the links in the description to check out Rob's work. He is a wonderful and a beautiful human being, very honorable and legit. I uh, will vouch for his work any day. Uh, and I'm looking forward to being on your show too uh, next month. That's going to be a lot of fun. It's kind of a little prelude uh, to what we're doing. Uh, well, this show is a prelude to the one that we're going to be doing on your channel. So thank you so much, brother. I appreciate you a lot. Love you, dude. Yeah, I love you too. And thank you for your kind words and your support, brother. And I can't wait to have you on. We're going to do this again and, and, and uh, do it a whole different time. I always love hanging out with you. Thanks so much for everyone else. Thanks for watching and listening. Uh, much love to everyone in the chat. Please be sure to hit the thumbs up button to help the channel out in the YouTube algorithms. Share, subscribe, hit the bell icon as well for notifications. The link to my channel on Rockfin is in the description. Sign up over there. Hit the follow button for my premium content. And you can catch this episode and any of my other episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or Google Podcasts and download them individually to your device for free on Spreaker.com. Calm. And remember, we're not only in a spiritual war, but a war on humanity. Stay aware, stay alert, keep loving your heart for everyone. Stay safe out there. And if you can see through the illusion, you are the solution. See you guys next time.